At the ripe old age of 27, I had a house, a husband who was gainfully employed, a one-year-old healthy child, a picket fence, a station wagon, and HBO. <laughs> I had it all. Well, actually, my child was really ugly. But, but he got handsome later. <laughs> I can't even get one time. So I had, I had everything except for my child being ugly, but we'll put that one aside. There's nothing you can do about it. And he didn't turn out adorable. And I'm thinking, like, I am better off than my parents. My parents had to wait a long time before they could achieve what I had achieved at the ripe old age of 27. And most parents think, and the reason many of you are in college and parents are giving you loans or taking out loans, is so that you could be better than them, that you would have more than them. And I did, and I was excited about that. So I, I move into my house, my son is perfectly healthy, and then after a short period of time, Michael developed epilepsy, where you have grand mal seizures. He developed a urinary tract disorder, which requires two operations to correct. He developed a liver problem. He developed an immune system problem, where they discharge him from the hospital because of the infectious disease. It was more dangerous for him to be in the hospital. He developed one thing after the other, and I'm thinking, what is wrong? I am perfectly healthy. My husband was perfectly healthy. So what possibly could be wrong? And then I realized it was my husband's bad gene pool, right? Because that's what we always think. So I thought, it must, be on, it must be on his side. And I looked at his family to see where all the bad genes were, only to find out they didn't have any history of asthma or epilepsy or any of these diseases. And I just couldn't figure it out. And I kept asking my pediatrician, how come? How come he's so sick? And the pediatrician said, well, the first time he said, well, Mrs. Gibbs, I think God gave you this sickly child because he knew you were the kind of person who could care and take care of him. And I'm like, no. God gave me a perfectly healthy child. Ugly, but healthy. <laughs> While living at Love Canal, I had a second child, my daughter Melissa. And Melissa seemed to be perfectly healthy when she was born. She was a little smaller than she should have been, but she seemed perfectly healthy. And then on Friday, she had these bruises. On Saturday, these bruises got more frequent. By Sunday, her entire body was covered from head to toe with black and blue marks. On Monday, I took her to my pediatrician, and I asked my pediatrician what was wrong with her. And my pediatrician said he didn't know, but he was going to take a blood test and send me home. And later that afternoon, he would call me and let me know about the results. So he took his blood test, and I took Melissa home, and I waited by the phone for him to call. And he finally called, and he said, Mrs. Gibbs, um, we believe that your daughter has leukemia. And here's what you need to do. You need to pick her up, put her in your car, do not put a seat harness on her, do not bump her or bruise her, and take her to Buffalo Children's Hospital. And remember, any pressure on any part of her body could cause an internal hemorrhage, so be very careful. Well, this is a toddler. And so I put her in the car. Of course, she's a toddler, so how do you get a toddler to sit still if you're not strapping them down? You know, I promised her an ice cream cone, so she was vested. So here's the first lesson. Promise somebody who does something for you to make our earth better an ice cream cone, and they might do it. <laughs> Give people rewards. So I promised her an ice cream cone, and she sat still, and she was just a perfect angel all the way to the hospital. And I, we went into the hospital, and the doctors came and took her and put her in sort of this makeshift emergency surgical um, room. Um, and then we put her on this crib bed thing, and the doctor pulls me out and says, I need to talk to you. And I'm like, okay. So he says, well, Mrs. Gibbs, because Melissa's blood count is so critical, we can't give her, don't want to give her, heavy anesthetic in order to do this test. And what this test is, is they insert a needle into her hip, 
and withdraw some bone marrow, and then look at it underneath a microscope to determine whether or not she has leukemia. So what they wanted me to do was go in and calm her down and hold her down while they performed this, this procedure. So I said, okay, I can do that. I'm a mom, I can, I'm out to this. This is my child, I need to protect her. And so I went into this sort of makeshift emergency room and here is Melissa, who is a toddler, she's three years old, screaming her head off, just screaming at the top of her lungs because she's so frightened and I had left the room. And as she screamed, her nose was hemorrhaging, her gums were hemorrhaging, and the blood vessels in her cheeks um, broke open. And I walked over and tried to calm my daughter down, and I couldn't. And I looked at the blood, and I said I couldn't do that. And I walked out of the room. And I stood outside of this um, door to this makeshift emergency surgical room. And I listened to my daughter crying, screaming, Mama, please. They're hurting me. I promise I won't be bad no more. And I tell you the story, not because my children suffered more than others. They didn't. My children survived. I tell you this story because while Michael was getting sick and while Melissa was developing this blood disease, while children were dying at Love Canal, the city of Niagara Falls, the county of Niagara, the state of New York, and the Environmental Protection Agency at the federal level all knew it. They knew it and they made a conscious and deliberate decision to allow our families to get sick and allow our families to die. How dare they? And each and every day in this country, decisions like this are being made, whether it's West Valley, whether it's a coal fire power plant, whether it's ash on roads, whether it's PVC in your product, whether it's a BFI landfill in your backyard. Every day these same decisions are being made. So here's how they made them at Love Canal, and it's similar in other situations. In 19, I found out about Love Canal in 1978. I picked up a newspaper. Michael Brown uh, was a journalist. I picked up the newspaper and I read this article about Love Canal. And it talked about 20,000 tons of chemicals buried in the center of the community. It talked about how the elementary school that my child was attending was on the perimeter of the dump and the playground was over the top of the dump. And every time the children were on the swing and their feet kicked up the dirt beneath the swing set, that dirt would go into the air and they would breathe it into their lungs. On that dirt was 100% pure chemicals, different types of chemicals mixed in the dirt. I read this in the newspaper. Nobody told me. So what they, what they knew and how they knew it came from that newspaper. In that newspaper, Michael Brown talked about a report done by Calspan and Associates. It's a consulting firm right across the street, actually, today still, for the Buffalo Airport. And in this report, Calspan, they talked about, it was done in 1976, so two years before I read the newspaper, years before my daughter was taken into that emergency room, they wrote this report. And in this report, it talked about the chemicals in the dump, and it talked about how the chemicals were leaking out, especially to the homes right on the perimeter of the site. It talked about the chemicals in these homes exceeding workplace standards. Now these are standards set for an adult male, 160 pounds, only being exposed 40 hours a week. So these numbers are larger than that, bigger than that, more pollution than that. In homes where men, women, and children were living 24 hours a day, seven days a week. 